had to bring about flagships and role as companions. And you were also in the committee that actually recommended this notion of flagships to the European uh, Commission. Right? So in that suggestion, you're also very much very active at this European level of pushing the bio water agenda. And on top of that, we're going to learn something really important. And that is uh, how fish is kissed. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Actually, I wanted to start it. Hello, good morning. I wanted to start into making a little bridge between yours' talk before, because I was used to work on EAPs before I got desperate and moved on. But, <laughs> but here's a, a little fish uh, that we were doing in the lab, like it was ages ago, and it's, uh, it's supposed to be a ray. Actually, see the fins here, EAP made of electrolytic polymers, and we just wrap them into a condom to make some white work. And and uh, this is how it was working. Uh, just to illustrate yours' point about electroactive polymers, what you can do with them is that you can see the scale of the thing. So you can really, really miniaturize it, it to, I don't know, a few centimeters. And this is something that you definitely can do with the current technology of uh, DC motors. Just to give you a comparison for uh, the best known example I know is uh, a ripple thin actuator by uh, Malcolm McIver from uh, Northwestern University. And this is a really, really complicated mechanical design. It's a fabulous piece and it works well. Uh, but you can see how mechanically complicated this thing is. And if you now uh, compare it to our little EAP fish, so it's very well illustrates about how mechanically simple things you can actually do with a thing like that. But as you also said, with our fish, it would be very hard on the other way to scale it up to that size, uh, to that size, because by the time we were running our little ray fish, it was running on two car batteries, just to power the little thing here. So uh, no way you're going to scale it up because the power consumption is going to just skyrocket. But uh, this was actually lead us to the topic of my talk, which is about uh, uh, fish and how to keep fish simple. So uh, if somebody who is not with the engineering background here maybe doesn't know that engineers like the term KISS and this means keep it simple stupid because this is normally what happens with uh, design. I think it comes from the software development <coughs> to developers community for some reason because their code is going to explore very, very fast. So the KISS approach is very important for them to, to Keep in mind that the same thing holds for mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, basically everybody. And uh, actually it should be also relevant for people who do research and do science because keeping things simple or re uh, reducing complexity of the phenomena that you are investigating is good to establish the importance or one or in the other factor. If there is a factor that you can take away but the system doesn't change very much, it means it wasn't a very important one, right? And you can make generalizations. So if you're a biologist and your theory is kissable, it means it's generalizable. And generalizable is good because you're making a bigger impact. So this is why I want to emphasize reductionist approach, but I just restricted, I, I'm not making any grand claims that this is the way you should do biomimetic design, but just giving a few examples on a very specific field of uh, fish locomotion and sensing. And just to recognize people who have financed our research. So uh, all this work and representatives comes from me and my colleagues on a philosophy project financed by European Union. And philosophy, uh, um, philosophy stands for fish locomotion and sensing. So this is what we do. We investigate how fish move and how they sense. And then we try to make robots that do in the same way. Or the other way, uh, speaking, we uh, go for bioinspiration and then we uh, build robots, but also we do the other way around, which may be relevant here for people who come from background non-engineering, is that robots doesn't need to be the end of the story. It also can be a tool that biologists can use to investigate one or the other phenomenon. So this is what we do, and we are especially interested in these things. If you want to copy biology, then biology is very complex and you have to reduce it somehow. You have to choose what to copy. We say, go uh, fish are excellent swimmers. We want to do robots that are like fish. But what's important there? Is it the way <coughs> they look like? Is it like their embodiment? The body like how you're made up, like what properties your materials have? 
Is the geometry in, uh, important? Or uh, is it the way you're actuating important? How your muscles move, is it this important? Is it important how you sense? Should you copy this one? Or should you copy how you control? Should it be a bio-inspired control? Or maybe something else, maybe you want to copy behavior <coughs> or something, there are other things you could even copy. So the question is, what is really important to achieve your goals and how to do the things in a way that still, in the end, give you a design that is not too complex and going out of hand. So, uh, um, just to give you a little idea of what we want to copy, we go and um, uh, make a brief in introduction about how fish move and how fish sense. And again, you know, you can have a whole course about locomotion in water and it's very, very interesting. But we do a very short introduction just to make you understand what we're dealing with. And we restricting ourselves uh, to um, fish that are fishy fish. There are 30,000 species of uh, underwater animals and very, very strange ways of locomotion. You can think of the same ray here or, or a seahorse or something. But uh, this is how people normally perceive what is fish. It's kind of a um, uh, way of locomotion that researchers call body and caudal fin locomotion. So this is what most fish fish do. And the mechanics and physics behind it is that you wave your body and the energy is going to travel along the body. And then you're moving away a certain amount of water. <coughs> you're converting some momentum to the water and you're pushing yourself forward at the same time. So this is what you do. You're, you're uh, sending energy backwards and with this energy you're um, pushing away from the water and you're going forward. <coughs> and of course there are different <coughs> ways you can do it. Uh, you can move only a little bit of your body, and this is what tuna fish, tuna fish do, and they get very high speed out of it, they're very, very, very fast. But when you have to stop, you know, it takes them for ages to stop and turn around. Um, uh, compared to an eel, for example, who is an aquiliform swimmer, and just wiggles as a snake, and this is, it's not fast, but it's very, very <coughs> maneuverable, very <coughs> agile uh, animal. And then there are other species that are, in the middle here, they um, move a, a longer or a shorter part of their body. These Japanese koi fishes here, they're classified as subcharangifer swimmers. And this is like, um, subcharangifer swimmer is a very generalist swimmer. You can uh, make it in all sort of environments, in very still water like here, but also searches and phase, uh, waves and rivers and ponds and everywhere. So, also salmon, for example, <coughs> and um, trout belong to the sub of her swimmers and they have to survive in different environments and migrate upstream and then they spend some of the time in seas and all the embodiment has to be such that it can um, cope with all this diversity of different underwater environments. So that's about fish locomotion. And of course fish have senses there. And again, we don't speak about all senses fish have, but we restrict ourselves to only one very peculiar sense of the fish. And this is a sense of uh, um, perceiving water, vorticity, fluid around the fish. Um, this uh, system of um, senses is called a costolateralis system, and it's comprised of a lateral line and an inner ear. And lateral line is something that for us is pretty hard to imagine what it is, because it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, similar to our touch sense, and then it isn't, because it's also similar to our hearing in a way, and it's connected to the inner ear, so it give you, gives you also kind of a sense of your orientation in the water, and all the things together, and um, uh, so there are two kinds of uh, physical quantities that you can perceive in water. One, one is the speed of the molecules moving, and the other is pressure. And um, a fish's lateral line system have like a dual modality. They have sensors that are pressure sensors, and then it has also sensors that are flow sensors. And um, uh, uh, for different species of fish, the topology of these sensors could be different just because of evolutionary purposes have developed in one or the other way, 
Some fish have a lot of these uh, um, sensors in the head and very little uh, along the rest of the body, and some fish could have it differently. But um, a biologist calls the sensors neuromasts, and the two kinds of sensors are surface neuromasts. And these are kind of um, cupula with hair cells inside them. So when the flow goes by, this cupula bends, and they give uh, the fish a sensation about the velocity of water. So it's a little uh, similar to what happens to your hair cell on your, on your body when you, you feel the wind blowing. But it's very hard for you to figure out how, how fast is the wind, right? But fish are really, really good at uh, understanding how, how uh, fast is the flow around them. And then there is another system of the same neuromasts, but they are embedded in a canal under the surface of the fish. And these are pressure sensors. They perceive the pressure difference of the flow around the fish. So fish put the so two senses together to perceive the environment. Um, here is uh, an example of, uh, of the sensors of the fish. So you can get more or less uh, understanding of um, how many sensors a fish like that has. This big spot here, so you can see, these are the canal neuromasts, and they are uh, placed along so what we know as a lateral line. But if you look at the uh, surface neuromasts, they're all over the body of the fish, so it's not really line shape, but they're everywhere uh, instead. But as I said, it's also, it also depends on what kind of a species you're looking at. And also there are a lot of uh, canal neuromasts in, uh, in the head of the fish, uh, perceiving pressure for this species for some reason, for some reason is very important. Um, so, Sorry, well, why is it better for sensing to have the little line rather than just sort of distributed? No, it is, I'm, I'm saying it is distributed around oh. the body. The surface neuromass here are distributed, but you know, I think in order to have this pressure sensing, you need to have a canal. So think of, you know, how many ways do you have to place the canal along your body? It's kind of, you know, what happens, okay, you could do a canal the other way around, perhaps, but for some reason nature didn't do it. It's, I don't know why, but it's an interesting question. So the canal normally goes along so what we know is a lateral line of the fish. And uh, it's also, if you think of it's a lateral line in some post sides of the fish, when you're a little bit uh, uh, rotating in the waters so and you get different pressures and different sizes, so you can think of what a, a fish is sensing, it's actually marvelous. I mean, if you start thinking about it. So what actually happens in the water, we have no idea what fish does. So, you know, it's, uh, it's actually, this fish is flowing in, is, is swimming in information. Just all the information, bits and bytes are coming all the time. And it does a very, very complicated signal processing to understand all the environment. I tell you how complicated signal processing is. Yeah. I would just add a comment yeah. that, mm -hmm. uh, about the distribution of the canal mm -hmm. zone, the canal for the mm -hmm. under mass. On the heads of fish, mm -hmm. there are incredibly intricate canals. That what are is intricate? Uh, intricate? Uh -huh. uh, uh, those are lateral in lots oh, of details. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Complicated yeah. patterns. And yeah. the idea is that the head of the fish fa faces into the flow. Yeah. Yeah. They need specialized forms of information yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming in as they move with great capture mm -hmm. and avoiding mm -hmm. prey. Mm -hmm. And the one along the body is probably exactly what they need for evolution for swimming. Yeah, yeah. But it's also interesting, you pointed out actually, if you talk to biologists who do lateral line sensing, for example, in Bonn University, Joachim Mochtens or somebody, and you ask that what is uh, the role of um, a uh, canal neuromast in a certain behavior or uh, flow of uh, surface neuromast, they don't know. They throw their hands up. And, and it's really, it's very hard to separate those different neuromasts either surgically or pharmaceutically or somehow. And since they do this behavioral experiments, if you do it to Joachim Morgan, he has a student training a fish. Can you, can you imagine to, to discriminate between different flow regimens? And the student is sitting in a dark room isolated so that you have no sound, you have no vision, you don't have anything, just, you know, the field which just sends um, the flow. And he's sitting there like uh, three months, five months, 
training the fish. If you think that your research is sometimes boring, <laughs> think of training your fish instead. <laughs> you have very interesting things to do. <laughs> so it takes a lot of patience, and, and these people actually do incredibly good work in Bonn University and in, in McHenry's lab also in other places to work on this uh, uh, sensing system of the fish. So just to make you understand how <coughs> complicated and how fish can do with this sort of information, it, as I said, the fish is flowing in information. So everything, he, what he does is that we go around and we uh, build a map of the campus or something else because mostly we have a visual system. Uh, what? What? They look the same size. With uh, great detection. They yeah, well, <laughs> well, you know, humans, we used to eat each other, so, <laughs> so probably some cannibal species. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So uh, fish do the same thing, they build maps, but they build probably maps based on this flow information. So you can think of a fish being in a bond and thinking, I'm going into this corner where there was this tickly flow around me. And you know, he has like a special map of orientation. This was a tickly flow, there was, you know, periodic flow, and this was a still water, and how these places are related to each other because of, say, lateral line sensing. And, uh, uh, what else do they do? They can understand <coughs> that other fishes ever communicate with other fish. Because when a fish swims, as you say, it moves water. And when it moves water, it creates vorticity. And this vorticity, when it pumps to the fish lateral lines, the fish can feel it. And this is also the way they can detect prey or they can detect predators. Um, here is a recent uh, experiment by Coombs and his colleagues. So he put a, a little dipole source, which is like a little vibrating pendulum in the water, and then a fish in that, and when the waves go and uh, hits the size of the fish, and the fish is moving and going to catch the pendulum. So this is a one way how they, how they detect prey and they detect predators. And it uh, has been also shown that, for example, blind cave fish who doesn't have any vision also have, has also these capabilities. So um, even if you take vision away, they are still able to <coughs> survive in very turbid and very dark waters because of this very interesting um, way of sensing. You're going to say something about the sensitivity? I'm bad at numbers. I give you one, yeah. Uh, it's on one of my slides, so I'm, I'm okay. getting there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me numbers, I have terrible problems with remembering numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, uh, one kind of a reflex of behavior that fish do when they uh, correspond to the changes in the flow is called triotaxis. It's a taxis behavior, it means it's respond to a stimulus or a stimulus gradient in a way. And the most, uh, uh, most of fish have it, almost all fish have it in some form or the other. And uh, uh, the most common way of a real taxis is how fish orient themselves with respect to the stream of the flow. When the flow is coming in, they orient, it, they orient themselves with a nose facing the stream. Why do they do that? Uh, migrating species do that to migrate upstream in the rivers. But also if you're standing in a place where there's a flow coming in and you stay there and you open your mouth, then you're probably most likely to get the freshest plankton and what, whatever is flowing there and you get it right there. Uh, so real Texas behavior is important for fish. But as you can see here, there are very many different uh, underwater environments. There are so many of them. So the next question we have is that how do we make sense of it? If we say that fish are maybe building these spatial maps of hydrodynamic maps for us from themselves, how do they classify which invent is which? How do they categorize different uh, uh, hydrodynamic events? And um, we didn't know how to do it, but we know how people in fluid dynamics categorize different hydrodynamic environments. And one very uh, general uh, notion for uh, somebody working in fluid dynamics is a Reynolds number, right? Every hydrodynamic environment can be categorized by the Reynolds number. If a Reynolds number is very small, then you are in a place like this. 
you have a very uh, smooth uniform flow with the radiance numbers of up to 100 or something. And when you're in an environment like this, or even, in a very, even worse, in an environment like this, then you have very high Reynolds numbers. It's chaotic environment. It's just turbulence, chaotic turbulence in places like this. And then you have somewhere in the middle when you have moderate near Reynolds numbers. And these environments are really, really interesting for the fish. Why is it interesting? Because uh, some places you have a smooth water, and in some places you have more turbulence. But this turbulence, it, it has some information <coughs> in it because it's not fully chaotic, it's periodic or organized chaos. So for, for fish, it's like uh, they get a periodic, periodic signals, information that they can filter out from that. It's a similar to what you're doing when you're tuning your radio and then you're just sometimes you, you, what you hear is white noise and doesn't make sense to you. There's no, not a single bit of information. And then you're getting to the station and then you're getting this organized chaos, so to speak, and you extract information out of it. And one thing that biologists have shown is that fish like to be in places like that, where they have this little information in the environment. Um, uh, this environment is um, easy to create in laboratory conditions and it's called the Karman Vortex Tree because of a Hungarian uh, physicist from Karman who investigated this periodic turbulence first. And maybe you don't pay attention to places like that, but this Karman Vortex Tree or periodic uh, turbulence is all around you. For example, when you're standing on a bridge and you're, talking, uh, you're, you're looking down in the water, so you get kind of a street of vorticities coming behind the pillar because a flow is coming in, a laminar flow is coming in from one direction, and then your obstacles would disturb the flow. And after that, depending on the shape of the obstacle, the that pillar is a round thing. So it creates a very nice periodic turbulence, something like you can see on um, the video like this. And this is also what um, we can do when we um, uh, play with experimental fluid dynamics. People who do experimental fluid dynamics are pretty good in creating the sort of environments in the laboratory condition. So the environment is good because uh, it makes sense. It, it happens in nature and happens often in, ra in, in nature, so it's relevant. But it's also easy to create artificially and uh, it's quite repeatable. So you, if, you, if you once created this Karman Vortex Street, you probably managed to do it second and third and fourth time at the same condition, more or less, because you know, the problem, there are two problems with fluid dynamics if you work on it. The first problem is it's fluid, and the second is that it's dynamic. So <laughs> things are never the same, but kind of, you know, when you put it there and don't freeze and walk on your tiptoe, it might even work. Uh, how do you do with this Karman Vortex Street in laboratory conditions is that people are having flow pipes in laboratory con con conditions. First, you have to make the flow laminar uniform so that there are no disturbances at all. And this is, for example, you can see in our center for biorobotics, the flow tank looks like that. There is a big pump here. And we pump water into a tube, and here is a stritener, flow stritener. Flow goes through it and becomes strite. And here are laminators, they are like big sieves and you pressure water through sieves, hoping that when it comes here into the working section, the flow is more or less laminar. And now into the working section here, you can put a cylinder if you want. You put a cylinder and you get this carbon vortex street behind the cylinder. And uh, how do we know how the environment looks like? Well, there is a wonderful system for that, which is called a digital particle image fellow symmetry system. And first you switch off all the lights and you see it's this water with little buoyant particles, neutrally buoyant particles. White little particles are put in the water and then you uh, switch on the laser and fill the laser sheet with a camera. And what happens is that all these particles in a flow will light up and you can see how the vortex is moving. Here is a cylinder here and this is the vorticity behind the <coughs> cylinder. Now when you do some image processing on a cylinder you can actually write up the vector field, or you can do even more complicated analysis on the flow here. Here's another example, which is um, 
Stellen Pass University, where you also can ha see the uh, uh, rotation of the vortexes. So blue vortexes are rotating in one way, and uh, red ones are rotating in the other way around. And this is a Karman vortex tree, so maybe you can understand the difference between the simulation, where everything is very, very nice, and this is now where the reality bites. It's definitely the periodic turbulence, and you can see, but it's not so nice and round vortices. Well, this is more like real experimental fluid dynamics when you get what you get out of it. Uh, also, uh, another way to investigate the flow is that we can put sensors inside the flow. We can get invasive. And why we want to do that? Because fish is inside the flow. It's kind of disturbing also the flow at the same time it's perceiving it. With a TPAV system, you get an overview. You're not disturbing anyhow. And you get it as it is, you get a background truth. But how it looks from a situated perspective, then you have to put uh, sensors inside the flow. And this is a pressure sensor. It took us, uh, you asked about sensitivity. So this is um, uh, a pressure sensor we took from a diving watch. Took uh, my engineer nine months to re engineer it, to get everything, all the electronics on board, everything decoupled. So there is such little noise as possible. And the sensitivity of the sensor is all, uh, about that if you put a centimeter of water on your fingertip, so the sensor is able to discriminate about the pressure of a. For a fish, these kind of sensors are 10,000 times more sensitive. So you can imagine. This is all we can do with off the shell, it's actually not off the shell electronics because it's a nightmare to re-engineer it. So it's not even available to so go and plug and play. But, but this is all we have an available with the current technology. But with this, um, uh, is the sensor on the left there? I don't know the wires now. Where is the actual, which is the actual sensor? Uh, uh, sensor is this one here. So this is on board electronics, amplifiers, and AT converters. Because if you put some off boards and you get so much noise, forget about doing any signal processing. But with something like this, you can see that if you, if you put the sensor in a flow and you turn on the flows, and you can actually tell about the flow speed in your working section, you know, start increasing speed all the time. You can see these charts are. Uh, but uh, another technology we are working with to get closer to real lateral lines is uh, microelectromechanical system sensor. So this is um, a sensor that is under development right now at our partner in Lecce, nanotechnology laboratory in Lecce in South City. Mm -hmm. And it's like a little hair cell. So this is something which is really of the size of a surface neuromass, just about 300 microns or 700 <coughs> microns. And you can see that the cantilever is bending. From the bending, we can send, uh, if, if we connect it to the wisdom bridge, we can uh, make a relation be between um, electrical signal and the bending of the cantilever and therefore the flow speed. But we haven't used these things yet on our fish robot because we're still working with them. So they're not as reliable as we hoped in the beginning. It's always like that when you do r and so we're on a halfway. But this is something that gets closer to the real sensitivity of real canal and, uh, and uh, surface neural mass. So if you put these things into a little straw, into a little canal, then you get a differential pressure sensor. So, and um, what else you can do when you start investigating the problem? You can put a fish into this TPIV system under a laser scene, and then you can investigate how the flow around the fish what happens when a fish moves and you record the signals, you process the signals, and you can understand how is fish disturbing the flow. So, uh, and, and if, you, if you take this fish and you extract the image, does it work? Yeah. Yeah. And you extract the image from there. So next you can do a midline extraction of the fish and understand how the fish body deflects. This is now a real 40 caudal fin uh, motion here, a real fish swimming. <coughs> and uh, what you can do next to take the previous slide where you have the TPIV system, the hydrodynamic event, and you correlate it to how the fish moves. And when you're lucky, you get a statistical correlation between the motion of the fish and the hydrodynamic event, which is created at the same time. Um, 
What else do we have? How else can we investigate a problem like this? One wonderful thing is theoretical mechanics. We can, instead of having real fish, we can model it theoretically. That's a very hard, uh, very difficult task to do. It's um, motion of a compliant body in a fluid. And this interaction is very, very difficult. But we got somewhere with this. So theoretical <coughs> mechanics, actually, if you're not afraid of equation, is a very powerful tool. Because instead of investigating, training a fish, and building your complicated systems, you can do things on a piece of paper. And you can play around with different variables to understand what is important and what is not important. So actually, it's a very powerful thing. But also, not just doing, uh, not just doing um, on a piece of paper, but another thing you can use is computational fluid dynamics. So you just, this is a brute force approach to analytical mechanics. You just run it on a very powerful supercomputer and hope it will converge, and sometimes it does. But also with this theoretical approaches, the problem is that who tells you that your simulations uh, are right? The only way to do it for a physicist is a validation. So how do you do validation? You still have to build your complicated systems in order to validate how your things work. And uh, this is also the thing that we're doing. This is our fish robot that we can model and later on validate. And as I said, on a the Lawson project, this could be the end of the journey. We just want to have a new fish robot that is working better than the previous robots. But also it could be just a tool or a method to investigate problems, what is important in a fish fluid interaction. Mm. So we we'll come back to the problem state. This was all introduction, by the way. <laughs> we got this introduction. <laughs> So I, I want now to come to the real thing, which is the, the problem we had. We wanted to make a robot that swims as a fish, right? But um, not only that we want to make it swim as a fish, but we wanted to use our KISS approach. So what we actually ask is that how do we mimic the swimming of the fish so that we end up with a system with a possibly low mechanical complexity, control complexity, or simple complexity. Uh, then we again come to the problem. We restricted the problem already, by the way, if you have noticed. So we have a Karman vortex street, and we're just interested in this particular environment. We disregard chaotic turbulence and all other things, and uh, we uh, restricted ourselves to body and caudal fin fishy motion, and then we restricted ourselves to lateral line sensing only. So the problem here is that if we put a fish like this, into a carbon water street. And this is what just fish is sensing, pressure and velocity on the surface of the fish. Fish knows it's in the middle here. And this one side is another side. How should the fish move there in order to have the best possible motion of swimming? And um, what is important? What should we pay attention to? What, what does it depend on how it moves most efficiently? Is it the body of the fish? that makes it so efficient swimmer? Or is it actuation, the way that we, the muscles are contracting? Or is it the sensing? Or is it control? Or is it all of them, or some single or of them? What kind of combination of all of the things? Uh, I come back to the problem, why do we use a karma water extreme? And this is um, a video done uh, some years ago in Harvard University in George Lauder's lab who was uh, investigating fishes in karma water streets. And as I said, fish like this environment. Why do they like this environment? They like this environment because probably uh, it's easy to swim there. What means easy to swim? Well, there are some studies that if you put a fish in a karma water street and then you catch it out and you measure the metabolic rate, what happens is the fish is less tired for some reason, swimming in a turbulence like that. And what they also did in Lauder's lab was that they tried to understand what is the fish exactly doing? How is it interacting with the vortices? And now the TPI video was a fish. And you can see that the fish is like slaloming behind the vortices. So you can hypothesize what happens is that the fish's body is somehow, it's working like, like a airplane wing or something. It, it makes a, um, use of the pressure differences on the surfaces or the boundaries of the vortexes to push itself forward. And uh, 
if you could now recreate a similar interaction between the vortex and the body, then uh, you would have a more efficient swimmer. And then again, come back to the problem that what do we have to do for that? Do we need um, embodiment? Do we need actuation? Do we need sensing? Do we need control? Do we need something else? And uh, biologists don't know that, by the way. If you go and ask them that what is the role of lateral line sensing in karma vortex treats, they, they said, I don't know what's the role of karma vortex treats, lateral line sensing, sir. It probably has some importance, but we don't know exactly what this importance is. And uh, now we come to a really remarkable example. This is a fish swimming in a karma vortex treat, right? It's swimming. And see what it starts doing. It starts floating upstream soon. See, it swims upstream. Okay, so the point here is that this fish is dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dead fish swimming, <coughs> swimming upstream. So, come back to our problem statement. What is important? <laughs> Do we need control? Do we need sensing? Do we need actuation? For God's sake, you put a f dead fish in it swimming. What control are you talking about here? Right? So here we come to a very interesting problem of passive dynamics. Is it suspended on a hook? Um, it has a little string here. Uh -huh. hmm. Okay. What makes it? No, I think they had one in the nose as much as in you. Otherwise, you could start spinning. Too. I know. The I proof I is I here. The proof is here, but many people tell you that this is an unrepeatable experiment. Can Nobody ever again? managed to repeat it. Can you try it again? Fish swimming is really, really interesting, isn't it? You can watch all over and over again, all the time. This is his so karma. His karma getting here. So you're saying deaf people can still walk? <laughs> <laughs> is that the conclusion? You know, it's it's a very interesting thing that you're asking, actually, because. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, I shouldn't have mentioned this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's no, actually the question you're asking me is that. I just shut up. Let me let me talk. That's it's my turn, right? <laughs> I'll say what you're actually asking is that what is the role of morphological computing in a behavior like this? And this is exactly what uh, people have shown with passive walkers. You have walking, you're going down the ramp, and you have no control whatsoever, nothing active, and you're doing that. So that's why evolution is not greater more. Well, I, I think because of the phenomenon like that, so it's again, exploits or passive dynamics, is why people have been wondering that salmon migrates a thousand kilometers up rivers, and when they start their journey, they stop eating. They don't eat anything, and they go upstream for a thousand kilometers. How do they do that? But they often go and rest in places like that when they have karma water street. And they're probably very good at exploiting the sort of vorticity and energy, energy harvesting for vorticity. So well, effectively, it would have been worse if it was downstream? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Because no, this no, no, fish no. looks like it is swimming towards no. the stomach. Mm. Hey, uh, and it's in the, against the mm. stream. You know what happens here uh, behind the cylinder? Here is the vortex separation point. Vortices come up from here and start forming somewhere here. This is vortex formation zone. And behind here is a suction zone. So this is a zone that you're exploiting when, you, you, when you're uh, uh, driving behind a big truck and your energy consumption is smaller. <coughs> the problem was the fish does in the end here is that it's just drawn into the suction zone in the end. With a, with a car, you can't exploit the vortices because you have a rigid body. But the fish can, if your car would look like a sail, maybe you would get this sort of uh, energy harvesting out of the uh, aerodynamic effects. But with a car, you can. All you can do is to sit here in a suction zone. Fish, I mean, uh, 
birds fly in formation. In formation, how can they fly? It's the same effect. Are they doing that? It's the same effect because they also creating the karma model street behind them. And also fishes, say, um, they swim in schools in a diamond uh, formation. That's the same thing, that they exploit the vortices <coughs> of the other fish. And by the way, it's speculated that how do the Jew is with the lateral line sensing. That we ha when you have your neighbor, your fish friend next to you, then you sense the vorticity of your neighbor fish. And you align yourself with your lateral line sensing just, you know, in the formation. But it's not proven. You know, biologists say tell us all sorts of things, but they can't prove it. <laughs> so, but uh, that's a question we are asking that what is the role of plastic dynamics and what is the role of actuations? And do we just, can we have a, if, if plastic dynamics enough, we can have an unactuated robot and we don't even need anything else, or do we need actuation? And the other point with the actuation is that uh, fish have a very distributed actuation. And you can see how much trouble we've had with this, as I showed the ribbon uh, film actuator to have a distributed actuation with the technology we have right now because all these motors or gears and bearings and say are bulky, they're big, they're noisy, they're everything. So it's very hard to do something that is as agile as a fish and small at the same time as the size of the fish. You more making it more complicated, it becomes clumsier, bigger, it's harder to control. How do you keep things like this simple? And, uh, one way to tackle this problem is to understand what is the role of the passive dynamics and what is the role of actuation. How much the motion of the fish depends on actuation and how much does the role of the, uh, of the behavior depend on the passive dynamics. So this is what experiments that we did. We did a real trout, a rainbow trout, and we measured the stiffness profile of the rainbow trout. And then we manufactured a tail, which is made of a silicon which is the same stiffness profile and the same geometry as the trout. So we have like an artificial trout body now. But instead of having the actuated systems, all the muscle coming along there up to the tail, we just actuated the same tail from a single actuating point, actuation point from the anterior part of the tail. And then we took our motion capture system <coughs> and we filmed the kinematics and analyzed the kinematics of the fish. What we got is that if we just actuate it with a single actuator, our kinematics is exactly the same as of a real fish. So we didn't need an actuation, a very uh, uh, complicated actuation system, just one actuator was enough. At low speeds, at cruising speeds, when it comes to high speeds or maneuvers like turning or something, it probably doesn't hold. But what does it tell you from a point of view of uh, biomechanical, mecha biomimetic mechanical design is that if you want to have a robot that just swims like a fish and does it with a cruising speed, you don't have to copy all the actuation mechanisms, the distributed actuation mechanisms. All you need is a single point actuator. But what is really important is a passive dynamics of the body. You have to be sure you make the same elastic properties, probably also viscoelastic properties, and geometry of the body in order to have the same actuation with the fluid. So, uh, there's another wonderful thing. You know, normally what we think, I'm coming from engineering and what I think from a biologist <coughs> in, in maths and physics, and the engineering things are pretty, and you can write them down in beautiful equa equations. Well, when it comes to biology, then it's uh, unprecise, it's slippery and stinky. So you just can't make sense out of it. But surprisingly, there are also, like in, in, in physics, there are some laws in bio biology that are also rather universal and very beautiful and very simple. For example, one of these laws is that if you think of a fish swimming and you want to know what it depends on, what fish can do, it can change its tail beat frequency, it can change uh, um, the phase of actuation uh, and amplitude, and probably some other parameters. So what is actually important when you want to control swimming? And people who have in, uh, investigated how fish swim, they've um, established that there is a very general law, and the law says that the frequency of the tail beat 
is linearly proportional to the swim speed. And it's unbelievably universal. It holds cross species. People have tried it all over and over again, and it always holds. For example, if you took another variable, you take amplitude. Amplitude is completely unrelated to the swimming speed. It doesn't depend at all. You can change it, not to change it, it's still the same. And another, uh, the next question we're interested in when it comes to biomimetics is that if we have this embodiment, which is exactly of a fish, the so, so same material properties, the same kinematics, would the law still hold? Which will also, you know, when you have control engineers, you're very, you get very, very happy when you have a linear control law. Because if you don't have linear, you're doomed. You have to make it linear somehow. Pretend it's linear. But uh, we, we wanted to try out whether it holds or not. So this is our little fish. It's a biomimetic fish tail, and we put it on a force plate. This is a measuring forces in all directions. And we put the same thing in uh, our flow tunnel, and we create a uniform flow. And by switching the bump more or less off, turning it uh, on or down, we can change the flow speed. And then we rec record the measurements. What does a measurement tell us is that how much drag and trust is a fish creating. If a fish is swimming uniformly, it balances out trust and drag. So you have to watch when the force plate readings collapse to zero, and then you have steady swimming on a certain flow speed. And what comes out from an investigation like this is that what you get is a beautiful linear control law. Here is a fish kinematics measured by Webb and his colleagues, and this is fish kinematics measured by Frank Bridge and his colleagues, and this is our. And it's beautifully linear. Uh, its orientation is different because it has a different stroha number, and actually if you try to interpret this slide, it means that uh, these fishes are more efficient, which kind of, you know, you would, you would think yourself you're not swimming very efficiently when you have a <coughs> rod through your stomach, right? So it's creating an additional drag, and this is probably responsible for the um, higher stroke numbers. But it must also relate, I assume, to let's say uh, uh, the, r the ratio of the fin size and body size and, and parameters of that kind. Uh, what, what matters is for a tuna, the, um, uh, the lunar, uh, lunar shaped uh, tail fins people have, inter uh, have uh, investigated, what matters is the area of the fin. Because mm -hmm. your area of the fin is bigger than you're able to move more mass behind with just one stroke. That makes you more stronger. Doesn't, doesn't mean you become more in efficient that way, but you can get to higher maximum speed with a bigger. Yes, I'm saying this relationship then probably only holds when there's a certain ratio of, let's say, body shape and size and the, and the size of its fin. Well, if, I mean, Robotics is a wonderful tool. You can, you can create some sort of a monster with a very big tail and very little fins and mm -hmm. investigate whether it holds or not. It's an interesting mm -hmm. problem. But the ecologists yeah. or the, the biologists have not looked at that? Uh, not in terms of what they haven't found is such a beautiful kind of a general law that yes, make your area bigger and then you get like two times more efficiency or something. Mm -hmm. fluid, fluid interaction is, it's a nightmare. You know, to, to look into the things. It's, it doesn't come out so easily. Here's also uh, a, a way of using our pressure sensors and closing the loop between actuation and sensing. We can monitor the flow speed with having a pressure sensor in the nose and correlating the, uh, pressure sensor readings to the delta beat frequency. So this is a flow tank here in Thailand now. The flow stripe in the nose, the working, working section. This is the pressure sensor we're using. We put the pressure sensor in a head. And then we put the thing in a flow tank and flaps the tail. It gets the pressure sensor readings and flaps the tail and when we monitor the force plate readings, it's always zero. So it's swimming with the right cruising speed. So, but what we can learn from it is that for a control of swimming, we can also have a KISS approach. We can have a very beautiful linear control law that we can use <coughs> for fish swimming. Uh, <coughs> this approach probably does hold to some uh, 
to, to some extent because fish do very complicated maneuvers too. All these laws hold for cr cruising speed only. So uh, if you want to um, accelerate, decelerate, turn, then you probably need an actuation which is distributed. And this is more like uh, you see this ordinary fish robot which are um, uh, built as a serial link manipulator so you can uh, control every joint um, uh, independently and have different kind of uh, motion. Actually, what also biologists know is that there are three variables that fish actively control, or the first variables, first order variables that fish control. So this, as I said, is a frequency, it's an amplitude, and it's stiffness. So instead of um, controlling um, phase or something else, they control the stiffness of their body. What they do with controlling the stiffness of the body is that with a different stiffness, you get different resonant frequency. With a different resonant frequency, you get a different amplitude at the same frequency. So this is how they actually control these amplitudes through um, changing the stiffness. But if you want to replicate something like this, then you have to go to uh, a changing stiffness. Here's again actually our, how we know it because we did our theoretical mechanics approach and then we tried it against a real swimming fish. And on a low frequency, we get the same kinematics. And for a higher uh, frequency, we get a very different one. Because if we want to get higher amplitude, we should make our system uh, more stiffer, which fish actually do. But if you start thinking of how to realize it mechanically, this is a point here where you are going to increase the complexity of your system. In one way or other, either you're making a, um, serial link manipulator, which is a long, big, and clumsy, or you're making some mechanical system for controlling the stiffness. So this is probably the place where we have to say goodbye to our KISS approach at this point. We can't make that simple system anymore. At least I don't know how to make it. Uh, as I mentioned before, biologists have told me they didn't know what is the role of lateral line sensing when the fish is farmangating. And um, I was interested in the problems that do we need sensing at all? I mean, in order to establish what is the role of sensing, first you can say that what if we don't have sensing at all? What happens if you take sensing away or the lateral line sensing away? You don't know anything about your hydrodynamic environment. You're just there. Can you figure out where you are? And uh, this is what we did. We put, again, a fish into the flow tank. Here is a cylinder. We make a farm of water street behind the cylinder. And then we put the fish uh, uh, mounted on the force plate at different places in the working section. And then we monitor the forces. And what we see is very interesting. Actually, when you're going from one side to another, then you get this sort of a drag measurement inside the Karma Water Street. And what's interesting there, from a control point of view, it has only one single minimum. So suppose you want to just follow this curve, curve here. What you have to do is to go against the gradient descent. And you're ending up exactly here, where your track is smallest and it's easiest to swim, <coughs> without using any flow sensing at all. So if you think how you do that, like mechanically, in, well, from engineering point of view, is that here we come to the difficulty. We would need a track sensor. I don't know whether you ever heard about it. I ever thought about it, but we don't have track sensors, humans. This is why when you um, driving on a, on a very good car, on a very good road, and you're not almost feeling anything, you're not feeling any speed, sir. When you, when you actually feel is acceleration because of, of your inner system, and fish has the same, they don't have a track sensor. But what happens is exactly like with you, when you're swimming against the car, you get more tired. What you can then monitor is your energy consumption, your oxygen consumption, and you're just starting feeling tired. So probably why fish are going there, it's a hypothesis. No biologist have ever confirmed that. But one hypothesis is that fish is going there because it gets less tired. It just feels that it's easier to be there, and this is all. It doesn't need any sensing besides its, you know, um, the sensing of its own body. Uh, whether it works or not, we don't know, because we never realized that on a, on a real fish. But uh, we're about to try it out. So that's actually a very interesting um, result from... What condition does this hold? On know? any karma water street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Periodic turbulence. Every, every periodic turbulence. 
you get a curve like that. And also when you go in this direction, you also get a curve like that. But it's like, you know, you go here, it's a big energy consumption, then you get to the vortex uh, formation zone and the energy consumption st uh, stops and then it becomes negative. So you're tracked into the suction zone. But there will be a limit to that, right? At some point, turbulence will overcome um, also the biomechanics of the system. So that will just be completely under the influence of the turbulence you're exposed to. I, there's, there, I mean, there's an upper bound, not to just turbulence. It's I, yeah, yeah, I think when you come to higher Reynolds numbers, mm -hmm. there's nothing to do. So this is also why fish don't like very high Reynolds numbers. I mean, how often do you see fish in a surf zone or somewhere? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm I think this is exactly why why they like to be there. The boundary, mm -hmm. these boundary mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. so there's definitely there. We I think we tried it with two float speeds with two different Reynolds numbers and it hold for different um, different Reynolds numbers and also different robots. So it really doesn't take what embodiment you have. You can have different type of tail and you still can follow the same law. So uh, if you want to reduce the drag of the swimming robot, then it's possible that you maybe even don't need any sensors at all, and you could just do it by uh, following the single minimum curve of an energy consumption. So that's another KISS uh, approach that we could take when we want to design a really, really simple fish robot. But now suppose we still want to know what's, what's, uh, what's the role of sensing. We put sensors on uh, fish and we want to know that how difficult it is to discriminate the environment. What does it take? How many sensors do we need to have? What is a minimal, the simplest configuration of sensors we need to have in order to understand whether we are in a Karman vortex street or outside the Karman vortex street? How do we move into the Karman vortex street? What does it take for fish to have it? And uh, one way to approach this problem is to say that we have um, uh, Fish is swimming in information. So we go and analyze this information first. We have the TPIV image of our system, and then we try to understand what information is in there in the flow. And we can take the TPIV Im image, and then we can, when it comes to statistics, we can do all sort of mumbo jumbo with the TPIV values that we have of the particles. We can take uh, uh, X and Y components of the speed, we can take the acceleration derivative, uh, we can uh, track the vortices, all sort of things. So what we're really interested in is that how does a fish know it is in a karma vortex tree? Does it sense it somehow? Does it discriminate for the rest of the um, environment? One thing that we understood is that what fish feels in a karma vortex tree is a single dominant frequency. If you take a power spectrum of uh, a frequency, to of the frequencies uh, present in a karma vortex tree, then you have just one peak standing up. And this is a vortex shedding frequency of the karma vortex tree. So probably all fish have to understand is that what's my power spectrum like? Do I have a single dominant frequency or do I have a many dominant frequencies? If, um, here is now the image of a karma vortex tree. A cylinder is here, and everything here that has a dark blue area is a single dominant frequency, just one single frequency. Here with the blue, you have two dominant frequencies. And here with the red, where green and red one, you have even more. Here you already come more or less to the uniform flow, and in uniform flow, you have a flat spectrum of everything. So the more away you are going from the center of the karma vortex tree, the more the other frequencies are going to dominate in these regions. And what we actually could do and find out is that we can prove from an information theoretic point of view that suppose you're a fish and you have only two sensors. You put an arbitrary in a carbon vortex street and you can say where you are with respect to the x and y axis. That's all you need, two sensors and the comparison between them. Um, and um, so this <coughs> kind of <coughs> feels like that it's very easy to do for a fish, just two sensors. It can say how far it is from the cylinder and how far it is from the mid uh, point of the karma water street. And this also is very likely to give you a control law how to move inside 
the karma walk street in order to position your, yourself on the right place. So we didn't know whether a fish used lateral <coughs> line in order to loca uh, locate itself in places like that, because the fish are not telling <coughs> us if they do, but it's possible to do. If we look at this image, it's possible to do it with having the lateral line sensors and to understand, make sense of the flow here. So uh, two sensors are sufficient to uniquely determine the pos in, in a position in a regular turbulence. But, but don't you assume that the fish can perform a Fourier transform? Yeah, I think they do. I think they're very good at Fourier transforms, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, next time, you have a grilled salmon on your plate, just treat it with respect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what, what biologists tell me is that you have, when you have this canal and uh, surface neuromass systems, they also work as hardware built, low and high pass filters. Mm -hmm. So lots of computing is done morphologically already. Mm -hmm. Also on the level of the real cells and, and the real sensing organs. So I don't know how fish perform for your transform. No, but of course, this is interesting, that there's in many sensory systems which for mm -hmm. other Absolutely. I don't know whether, has anybody proven people do Fourier transform? I mean, not consciously. Mm -hmm. Well, the mm -hmm. I think it's the same what happens with the surface of canal neuromass <coughs> that we have this cupola with the uh, hair cells of a different length. And it does some filtering, some sort of a filtering there. I don't know exactly what, but there's definitely some that information. Is like there's an unrolled cochlea, yeah. so you mm. might assume there's the same place for holes. Do you know more yeah. about yeah. it? Uh, I'll just with the yeah. biology field of this, that um, the strong hypothesis is that the auditory Actually, I wanted to try uh, a dead robot swimming experiment in my lab, but it never worked out. So um, one thing is that some people are really skeptical about this experiment, saying that this is not repeatable. And even Chim Liao himself is saying that it just happened. You know, we were investigating actually how the dead fish claps a day, and then oh, it swims upstream. And they didn't plan an experiment like that. <coughs> They never managed but to repeat it, but it was enough to publish in Nature. So, but it's been ten years back, right? That was published. Yeah. Public. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, and no one succeeded in replicating it. That's that's sort of interesting. <laughs> Not as far as I know, nobody. It would be nice if we could try. <laughs> I I tried <laughs> with a, I tried <laughs> with a dead <laughs> robot, but I never managed to do that. No, but you can you can get a dead trap from the supermarket. Of course, we yeah. can get some other time. Do you wash my basin later on? <laughs> Things like your fishing harbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we do it all the time. Mean, yeah. It would be very interesting to try this in a silver model mm -hmm. of, of yeah. various shapes. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what probably happened, what we speculate here is that, just a moment, is that what really matters here is the um, uh, ratio between the size of the fish and the size of the karma vortex street and the periodicity. So one thing that's going on in my lab right now is that we have the silicon tummies of fishes of different different sizes and they put them in a karma vortex street and then we monitor the forces 
to see whether there is some favorable ratio of the cylinder size and the fish size when the sort of a phenomenon occurs. But I will let you know if I find out something. I know in lamprey, when they swim at different speeds, the extent of the body that's actively contracting increases. And mm -hmm. It goes from uh, well, this about 50% of the body up to almost I think this is happens because they're regular stiffness. So, uh, but if you now can sense the Karman vortex treat, and then you want to do the Karman, what biologists call is a Karman gating. This is what you could see on the video of Jimmy Lau, that he puts a, a fish on a, uh, on a, uh, in a Karman vortex treat, and it starts swimming with uh, a frequency, so that the tailbeat frequency matches the vortex shedding frequency. And this is what we can do now. We can put the sensors in the head, and uh, we can flap the tail with the same frequency. So we are closing the loop, control the loop for a carbon grating. And I think it's a very kissable approach actually, because uh, all that we need is just two sensors in order to understand whether we have a single dominant frequency, filter out this uh, frequency and feed it to our thermal motor, which is just has one well single actuator. And it works perfectly, beautifully. But as you pointed out, I haven't, Yet with this kind of approach uh, comes the en energy harvesting phenomenon. So what we're working right now is that we have the same picture here and we're monitoring the first pl uh, force plate readings. And one thing you want, want to s may think of is that what really matters is timing. When the vortex hits the head and then we travel along the body and when the fish pushes away from it, that probably has some significance. So what we want to do is to understand when we get the vortex here in the head and send TPIV over the tail and to understand that and at the same time monitor force to understand that what has to be the relation between this point here and this point here in order to get the best, if not energy harvesting, at least uh, drag reduction. So it's a speculation, but we think it depends on the timing of the vortex. I'm almost there. Um, yeah, um, here's another thing that you can do with flow sensors when you come out from a karma vortex streets now and you go to the uniform flow. So as I said, Rio Texas is a um, phenomenon where fish uh, uh, face the stream. And again, it's the simplest controller for a robot that you can imagine is a Breitenberg controller, I think. Otherwise, no control at all. So a Breitenberg vehicle, uh, does everybody know what a Breitenberg vehicle is? I, I know at least one person who didn't know in this room, but okay. <laughs> but, <you laughs> but, he, but, yeah, but he's very quiet, so. <laughs> I, I think an interesting issue, is there any other possible controller? You know, when you think about it, neurons can either decussate or go around one side of the nervous system. There's no other possibility, so. Mm -hmm. Breitenberg vehicles is something that all roboticists build first when they build robots. That's actually, that's actually a Lutheran controller. That was huh. proposed by Jacques Loub in about 1910. And Breitenberg just stole from him, or what? Yeah. Oh. Loub published in German, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, uh, Breitenberg controller is the first thing any roboticist builds when it takes a robotics class. It's, it's this little uh, Lego Mindstorm robots and you make you follow the line or you make you uh, move against the light or something like that. It takes two sensors and then you take a different. But uh, nobody has ever done uh, Breitenberg control with, re with respect to the flow. And this is actually very recent. Uh, uh, I got this video. I you want the music with this one? No, not in the next one. Oh, okay. I'm almost there. Um, why doesn't it show anymore? Yeah, no. Uh -huh. It's actually, we filmed it yesterday. <laughs> so this is a fish robot. See the pressure sensors. Um, for a Breitenberg control, you need pressure sensors, uh, two pressure sensors. For a Breitenberg control, you need two sensors and take a different. But we have four, and we average between them because we want to get a more reliable signal. 
and then we put in a flow gun and it's always uh, orients its nose to the stream and with the lids we can monitor in the stream how it flows and it's pretty stable I have to say so it very much what it actually does is really a real Texas behavior so it's the first time somebody put Breitenberg vehicle on a fish robot and senses a flow but what's even more significant is actually that people have been underwater been building underwater robo robots for, I don't know, 50, 60 years, and nobody ever put flow sensors on board of a robot for some reason. So, uh, uh, and, and this is now the last uh, KISS approach, which says <laughs> that if you want to do a Breitinger controller, uh, if you want to do a real taxis, all you need is actually two sensors, commercially available sensors. You put it on the both sides of the head and off you go. You get a real Texas behavior out of it, which is pretty stable. So, um, what else do you have? Conclusions, but you heard some already. Ah, now I have a video, just a moment. Is, is this a... Is this the right one? Mm -hmm. Oh, just one more slide and just I got inspired from so many people and I'm working with so many people. I just wanted to say a little thank to all these people I've stolen ideas from and who work with me and uh, who work hard in my lab to get all these experiments done, which is underwater engineering and fluid dynamics. Experimental is not an easy thing to do. So all my credits to all my team and philosophy team and, and all these people. Uh, and uh, greetings from the whole philosophy team, but uh, we also have a little video in the end, like, um, of the philosophy project. Does it play? Hmm. No. Is this on your screen? Hmm? Yeah, this is on my screen. Just search it, just a moment. I can run it um, outside of the presentation.
something into it. And, and this is also um, um, to your previous questions that why don't we see fish swimming, dead fish swimming upstream all the time? Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly what happens is that you have a very delicately tuned <coughs> interrelationship between the material properties of the body and the periodicity of the mm -hmm. environment. If this happens, you get an effect like that, you feel published in nature. Well, the, the other issue is that they're statically unstable role playing because the center of mass is uh, above the center well, of buoyancy. Well, the dead fish fell is up, right? Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So <coughs> in those experiments, did they go belly up? Uh, you mean the house experiments? Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen the belly up. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's a kind of interesting thing <coughs> in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the buoyancy. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So in some sense, you, so you advertise uh, kids, and I'm a bit disappointed you're not wearing some uh, the fell uh, shoes with it, <laughs> but okay. Next, Next time. time, exactly. <laughs> um, but in some sense, you could also, so when you look at the number of phenomena that actually have not really been addressed yet, right? Mm -hmm. There's not like a state, uh, an established state of the art, in fact, to, let's say, building artificial fish and how they could swim and so on. Mm -hmm. And you could actually argue that with your approach, all things are getting more complicated because you've talked about a much more integrated system. To understand swimming, you look much more now at the relationship between sensing, morphology, and signal processing. While the engineer who is not wearing your those old shoes would say, Oh, but look, we have it all sorted because of these nice modules and they exchange signals, so it's very controllable, very simple. Mm -hmm. So I could also argue that actually you make it much more complicated. Uh, so why should we still call this yeah. case? Uh, because I'm making things complicated research wise. But probably is going to merge, hopefully is going to merge in some very, uh, very easy engineering approach. But these mm -hmm. engineers can do because they do incremental things. Mm -hmm. And they have to do incremental things because they're engineers that do the research. But uh, uh, with this body fluid interaction, people have investigated morphological computation um, out for passive waters. And why is it don't do it in underwater robotics? I don't know whether you ever noticed that all technologies move underwater about with at least, I would say, 10, day, 10 years of delay. Mm -hmm. Because with every technology or research, it's easier, you know. Underwater engineering is such pain. Mm -hmm. Nobody can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's always easier to try the things first on Earth and mm -hmm. then go underwater right. on the ground. Mm -hmm. But now, is the notion of morphological computation like a misnomer in some sense? Because in some sense you're saying we don't need computation, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought about it. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we agree with that. So thank you very thank much. You. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, so Marta, thank you very much. Thank you.